Get to the bottom of the origins of the Russia probe, authorizing a slew of subpoenas in the Senate. So what are the next steps in this investigation? Joining me right now is the chairman of the Senate Homeland Security Committee, Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson. And, Senator, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for being here. You have been really Morning, zeroing Brian. in on the transition period, the supposed to be peaceful transition of power from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. You are the one who told us about the leaks, 126 leaks in 125 days. What can you tell us about your investigation, sir? Well, let me first start by saying that uh, Ambassador Grinnell, Attorney General Barr are, are just heroes. Uh, they really are patriots in this very sad saga in terms of corruption of the transition period. And really looking forward to working with uh, John Radcliffe as the new uh, Director of National Intelligence. Uh, but I agree with uh, Ambassador Grinnell. Transparency is not political. Uh, I'm kind of amazed at the resistance I've had in my own committee to uh, get the information, whether it's from Blue Star Strategies or now the, the other subpoena power, that, or the subpoena authority that I've, I've obtained. You know, what are they afraid of? But I really thought probably the most uh, interesting part of uh, the Grinnell interview was the way, and he's seen more information than I have. He's, he's you know, been director of national intelligence, so he's seen more classified information. So we know because of the footnotes that uh, were previously declassified that uh, my staff found that the FBI was well aware that Russia tried to infiltrate the Steele uh, organization, that Russian dis disinformation was actually in the Steele dossier. And what Ambassador Grinnell just revealed is that uh, members of the intelligence community also understood that and they were either pushed aside or their information was classified. I, I think that's pretty darn interesting. So, you know, from our standpoint, what our investigation is going to be centered on is, the, you know, the basic thing that it always boils down to who knew what and when did they know it? I mean, who did all these leaks? What was the purpose of these leaks? I mean, were they trying to cover something up? Uh, was it a massive U.S. led? Uh, IC community-led disinformation campaign, a diversion operation, or was it simply to uh, delegitimize the election and you know sabotage this administration? Those are the basic questions we're going to be answering or try, you know asking, and hopefully get the answers for the American public because transparency is all about getting the truth out so the American people understood what happened. So hopefully it'll never happen again. This corruption, the transition process. Well, you know, part of the leaks, I think, was to muddy up names in the Trump uh, administration or the Trump campaign. For example, Carter Page told us on this program that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he starts getting all these phone calls from the press. Why? Because they started leaking that Carter Page had funny dealings with Russians. And so that started uh, its own, you know, narrative in the press. And I just want to point out that all of these years later, Carter Page was never charged. So for, for a year, he was surveilled unlawfully, uh, wiretaps uh, so that they could get into the Trump campaign. And four years later, three and a half years later, Senator, uh, there's no charges on Carter Page. No, Maria, what's really interesting, if you compare the investigation into Hillary Clinton's email scandal, uh, that, that was not an investigation really designed to uncover the truth to lead to prosecutions. It was really an investigation designed to cover up the truth and exonerate Hillary Clinton. You compare that to Crossfire Hurricane and Crossfire Razor, the investigation of the Trump campaign's collusion into Russia and, and Flynn. I mean, those were witch hunts. And, you know, again, you have to ask, what were they trying to accomplish? And it sure seems to me that they were highly political and either trying to cover up the wrongdoing because they understood how improper it was to do all these unmaskings, to, to be investigating a campaign, to surveil members of the campaign, uh, also to sabotage uh, this this administration. So th th those are the you know, we generally know the outline of what happened, but we really need to know understand who knew what when. And I'll tell you what I thought was very interesting about uh, Rod Rosenstein's testimony is I was it was it was an astonishing lack of curiosity and management oversight over regarding an investigation into the sitting president of the United States. I mean, th think about that, Maria. So I, you know, I look at Rod Rosenstein, I go, well, you know, either it was willful ignorance, complete managerial incompetence, or he simply wasn't being truthful. I want to get to the bottom of who knew what and when did they know it. Will you be able to get to the bottom of it? That whole time when Rosenstein was uh, testifying, he said, I didn't hear that. I didn't know that. Had I known that, I would not have signed the warrant. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. 
can they all say that? Or do you, I mean, and then you mentioned the Hillary Clinton email investigation. The one individual who was overseeing both investigation, an investigation into Hillary Clinton and an investigation into Donald Trump in the summer of 2016 was Peter Strzok. Well, I'm sure there's going to be an awful lot of uh, claims of managerial incompetence because it's a lot better than you know, really admitting that you did something wrong, something illegal. Uh, but we're going to first start out with a you know, thorough review of the documents. Uh, we're, we're in a better p position than what uh, you know, Devin Nunes was in the House a couple of years ago when they were undertaking those interviews because we know so much more. So we have their interviews, and by the way, that's part of the logjam of information that's broken, is those were declassified. Uh, we'll have additional documents, and now we have a lot more information. So uh, you know, I think our interviews would probably be a lot more interesting, a lot more revealing. But no, we're, we're going to have people not recall certain things. I mean, James Comey refused to have his classification reinstated before he was interviewed. I wonder why he did that. So no, there are so many unanswered questions that uh, the American public really deserves the complete answers to. Unbelievable. Do you think the John Durham uh, criminal investigation will conclude uh, this summer? Wh when are you expecting that? I want to quickly move on to Biden, because I know that's also an investigation uh, that, that you're involved in right well, now. I, I hope so. But again, that's all designed to prosecute and indict. What congressional oversight is all about is, you know, first of all, getting okay. the information to inform public policy and inform the public. Two, two, two totally different objectives. Yeah. Real quick on, on Biden, what have you learned in terms of Viktor Shokin, which, of course, we know that Joe Biden wanted him fired in Ukraine? First thing I learned is subpoenas are powerful. You know, we, we asked Blue Star Strategies, this Democrat-led lobbying firm that was, that was uh, representing Burisma, back on December 3rd to start cooperating with our committee. Six months later, they had, they had turned over 149 pages and sent a letter saying they were fully cooperating. The subpoena now has resulted in 2,600 pages of information. So, so we've learned the subpoenas work. But the big question I have is, what was the serious offense of, of Victor Shokin. Why did the U.S. government come to the conclusion that he had to be fired and they resulted in a very serious threat on the part of Vice President Biden? It doesn't make any sense. And literally, we, we've been trying to get from the State Department to actually have an oversight letter specifically asking that question. Why did the U.S. government require the firing of Victor Shokin? I have no idea. It, it makes no sense to me. Now, we know that Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, was working in Ukraine. So we're going to keep talking about that with you real quick before you go. A word from you on the homeland, given your role on the committee uh, with all of this unrest going on across the country, whether it's Atlanta or Seattle. Your thoughts. How do you what, what would you like to see President what? Trump do? Well, first of all, it's curious the press hasn't been reporting on the citizens and, and the businesses and the property uh, that are trapped in, in the new nation of Chaz. Um, you know, it is our responsibility to protect the constitutional right, the life, the liberty, the pursuit of happiness of every American citizen. Uh, I, I was amazed at uh, Mayor Durkin's a very glib response in terms of, you know, how long could this uh, Seattle, this section of Seattle look like this? And she said, well, who knows? It could be the summer of love. Her job is to protect the constitutional rights of every one of her citizens. If her and Governor Inslee aren't willing to do that, I think that's what President Trump and the federal government is going to have to step in and do. But I guess we'll give them some time. But I'd just like to, to know how many citizens, how many businesses, how many constitutional rights are being trampled on right now by the nation of Chaz. All right. Senator, it's great to get your insights this morning on all of that. Thanks so much. We will keep... Uh Check, checking back with you, Senator Ron Johnson. We'll take a break. I will be just discussing all of this and more in my exclusive interview next week with Attorney.